Welcome everybody to chapter three, part two. So now that we have learned how to take a derivative using various methods, product rule, quotient rule, chain rule, uh, and the definition of the derivative, we're going to be moving on to applications of derivatives. So in this chapter, we're going to be looking a lot at rates of change. So just a reminder that when you are finding a derivative, you are finding the slope of a tangent line at a specific point. Now, all a slope of a line is, is a change in y over change in x, or a rate of change of y with respect to x. So just a reminder, from way back in chapter two, we talked about velocity and a little bit in chapter three, part one. Velocity is the rate of change of position with respect to time. So if I were to draw myself a position time graph, so if I had time on the x-axis and distance in, let's say, meters, and let's say seconds for time, if I drew myself a line or a curve that showed the distance of an object with respect to time, and then I drew a tangent line, right? The slope of this line would be rise over run or delta D over delta T, right? And so your slope M would be delta D over delta T, which is change in meters or your change in distance over change in seconds or meters per second, right? So if I had 10 meters over three seconds, I could reduce that into a meters per second unit that would be my slope. So that would be my velocity. So the slope of that tangent line is my velocity in meters per second. So therefore velocity is a rate of change of position, a change in position with respect to a change in time. So we're looking at how does the position change as time progresses. Okay. So what that means for us, which we've already seen, is that the velocity is the derivative of the position function. Okay, so if we take the derivative of the position function, we get our velocity. So if we have a particle moving in a straight line measured in meters, given by this equation, uh, S equals, where T is the time in seconds, I'm going to rewrite this just as F of T equals T cubed minus 9T squared plus 24T. I know my velocity is the same as F prime. And we know this from chapter 3, part 1, our very first section. Uh, 2.8, the second lesson, we looked at how the definition of a derivative was the same as our limit formula for instantaneous velocity at time t. Those were the same. So we can assume then velocity is the derivative of position. Okay, so if I find this derivative, I get 3t squared minus 18t plus 24. Now, if I want to find my velocity at exactly three seconds, I'm finding V of three, which would give me three times three squared minus 18 times three plus 24. And if I plug all that into my calculator or do some fantastic mental math, I get negative three meters per second because our question, it tells us time is in seconds and distance is in meters. Okay. Now the next question is when is the particle at rest? So a particle would be at rest when your velocity is equal to zero. So that's what we need to find. When is our velocity equal to zero? So V of t would be zero if 3t squared minus 18t plus 24 was equal to zero. And we find that by factoring. So I'm gonna factor out a three. And then I can factor these brackets. 
So that gives me my particle is at rest if t is 2 or 4. And this one would be okay. So these should be fairly simple calculations for you guys at this point. We're finding the derivative and we're solving for t, which is just a quadratic here. Um, the next part is where it gets a little bit tricky. So when are we moving in a positive or negative direction? So for people who've taken physics, this is a piece of cake. For people who have not taken physics, uh, some of these questions going forward do tend to get a little bit tricky for people. So uh, if you need to pause the video at any point and go back and redo a um, an example that I've shown, go for it. So if we're moving in a positive or negative direction, all this means is if we were moving in a negative direction, our velocity is going to be negative. If we are moving in a positive direction, our velocity is going to be positive. Okay, so this is what we're trying to find. Where is our velocity positive and where is it negative? Now, there's two ways of doing this. Okay, option number one is to draw yourself a quick sketch of the parabola that represents our velocity. So we know that v of t. is equal to, what was it? It's 3t squared minus 18t plus 24. That's our v of t. So this is a positive parabola, or it was equal to 3 times t minus 4, t minus 2. It's a positive parabola. It opens up, and it has x-intercepts at 2 and 4. And it looks something like this. It does not need to be perfect. Basically, what you're trying to find is when is this parabola positive and when is it negative? That's all we're looking for. Well, we can see that it's positive up here and it's negative down here. So this parabola is positive when x is less than 2, or I guess I should say t, sorry or when it's greater than four. Now, the only problem is, is that we also know that t cannot be negative. We can't have negative time. So with the further furthest left chunk here, we know that this is going to stop when it hits the y-axis, meaning the smallest t we can have is zero. So on the t is less than two portion, I'm actually going to also include that it's bigger than or equal to zero because our time can't be smaller than zero. I'm not including two or four in my intervals because my velocity is zero at those points. It's not moving. Our particle is stopped at two and four. So it can't be moving in a positive or negative direction because it's stopped. So it can't be doing both things. So at that very instant of time is two and time is four, we do not um, move in our positive direction. Therefore, we cannot say or equal to here in our intervals. We also know that v of t is negative by looking at our picture when t is between 2 and 4. So between the x-intercepts, we have the negative portion of our parabola. Okay. The other option is to do interval testing, which depending on who your teacher was in grade 11, you might have seen this before, you might not. And for interval testing, we did a little bit of this in our review chapter. Okay? In order to determine when our velocity is positive or negative, we're basically looking for what are the signs of these two factors. So if they're both positive, then this is going to be positive. If one's positive and one's negative, then our velocity would be negative. And if they are both negative, then our velocity would also be positive. So we're basically trying to see when is each factor positive or negative, And therefore, when you multiply them, do we get a positive or a negative answer? 
So for each of my lines here I have set up, I'm going to put a separate factor. So I'm going to do t minus 4 on one of them, t minus 2 on one of them, and then the entire um, velocity on the last one. The 3 I don't need. I can include it if I want. But that 3 is not going to change whether these are positive or negative here um, because of how multiplication works. So the other thing I need is on each of these, I need to include the zeros of all of the factors I'm considering. So our zeros are 2 and 4. And then if I take a look at the factor t minus 4, I need to pick a value in each interval and see whether this factor would be positive or negative. So for example, if I'm looking at this interval here, I'm going to have to pick a t value less than 2. So I can pick anything less than 2. Generally, if I can, I'm going to pick 0 because it's easy. So if I pick 0 and I do 0 minus 4, I get negative 4, which is a negative number. In my next interval right here, maybe I'll pick something like 3. If I do 3 minus 4, I get negative 1, so I get a negative number. And then in my last interval here, I need to pick something bigger than 4. So maybe I'll pick 5. If I do 5 minus 4, I get 1, which is a positive number. And then I can repeat this for my other factor. My other factor, if t minus 2, if I'm in this first interval, if I say pick 0, I'm going to get a negative number. If I pick something like 3, I would get a positive number. And if I pick something like, say, 5, I'm also going to get a positive number. My last line is, well, what happens if I multiply these? So if I multiply these two things together, a negative times a negative gives me a positive. If I multiply these two together, a negative times a positive gives me a negative. And my last interval, if I multiply these two together, positive times a positive gives me a positive. And then I can look and say, well, this is positive and this is positive. So this means V of T is positive. And this middle one is negative. So this is where V of T is less than zero. So we've found where we're moving forwards or backwards. Okay. So we are moving forwards. We're in a positive direction is the wording they used in the question. This is where V of T is greater than zero. When, and if I look at my interval, my two values where V of T was greater than zero was less than two or greater than four, right? Less than two here and greater than four is here. Now, the only thing again is we know that time can't be negative. So I'm going to include greater than or equal to zero on our first interval. And then we have that we're moving in a backwards direction or a negative direction. In that middle interval, when t is between 2 and 4. So I get the same answer either way. The methods are different. It's totally up to you which method you'd like to use. So there's the brief sketch method or the interval testing method. I prefer to do the sketch much faster and it doesn't need to be perfect. All I need to know is where are my x intercepts? Am I opening up or down? That's it. So I would be using option one here. I guess I should have written option number two here. There we go. Okay. So either one will work. So part E is asking us to draw a diagram to illustrate the movement of the particle. So the movement of the particle is our distance or our S values.
So our original function they gave us was s equals t cubed minus 9t squared plus 24t. So we know if this is the movement of the particle, let's say this is a distance of zero, and then this is my this is showing my distance in meters. Okay. So I know at time two and time four, I'm stopped. I know from time zero up till time two. I'm going forwards from two to time four, I'm moving backwards. And with T is bigger than four, I'm moving forwards again. So our first big question is, well, where am I at time zero? What is my distance at time zero? Because my particle does not have to start here and move forward. My particle could start over here and move forward. And then it could move backwards that way. And then it could move back forwards that way. We don't know. But that's what we're trying to figure out. So I need to know at time is zero, what is my distance? So if I use my original function here that I have, it would be zero cubed minus nine times zero squared plus 24 times zero, which is zero. So I am starting at zero. At time zero, I am starting at zero. Now I know I'm moving this way. I'm moving forward until time is two. So the question is, at time two, how, where am I in my distance? How far did I make it from here till time two? So S of two would be two cubed minus nine times two squared plus 24 times two, which gives us 20 meters. So this thing has to keep going this way until I get to wherever I want to mark 20 meters down. Now we know at time two, I stop. My velocity is zero. So for all this time, my velocity is positive. I'm moving in the positive direction. I'm moving forward. At time two, I stop and then I turn around and I go the other way, right? At exactly time two, I'm at 20 meters. But for that instant, my velocity stops and then switches to start moving the other direction because from time two to time four, I'm now moving in the other direction, okay? And again, the question is, how far am I moving? 10 meters would be about here. Am I getting all the way back there before I stop and turn around again? Am I going here? Or maybe I'm only moving a couple meters and I'm stopping and turning around here. Maybe I'm moving all the way back to time where time was zero to a distance of zero. Maybe I'm starting to move in a negative direction past my starting point. We don't know. So what we need to know is we need to know at time four, where am I when I stop again? Okay. And if I plug all this in, I get 16 meters. So my answer is I didn't make it very far before I stopped and turned around and started heading off in my positive direction again. Okay, so again, at an instant of time is four, I'm stopping instantaneously, and now I'm switching back to moving in a positive direction, and I'm gonna keep going this way forever. Okay. And from our parabola graph of the velocity, our graph looked like this. This makes sense. We were moving positive, 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 but our velocity is slowing down, stopping instantaneously at the x equals 2 or t equals 2 value. Then you're moving negative direction, negative direction, negative direction till you stop at time 4, and then you're heading back in the positive direction forever. So that's what our picture shows us here. So the last question for today is asking, well, what's the total distance traveled in the first six seconds? Well, our picture is helping us a lot here. So we know from zero to two, we traveled 20 meters.
we know from two to four, if we look at our picture, from two to four, we traveled from 20 back to 16. So we traveled four meters from two to four. Okay. And then our question is, is since for the first six seconds, we need to go from four to six. So we need to know, well, at four, we were at a distance of 16. Where do we stop at time is six? So I need to know what S6 is. And S6 is 36. Okay. So at S4, we were at 16 meters. At S6, we're at 36 meters. So from these two times, that means we traveled a total of 20 meters. So my total distance traveled would be 20 meters in my first two seconds, four meters in my next two seconds, and another 20 meters in the two seconds after that for 44 meters total. And that is it for today. So basically, we're just looking at if a particle is moving, what, what does that look like? How do the velocities link up with what's happening to the particle? And um, if you've got a distance function, the fact that the velocity is the derivative of your distance function. Okay, and that's all for today.